Well, good morning, <coughs> Cross Life. How is everybody today? That was lousy, to be quite honest. <laughs> How you doing today? You doing all right? We get to come in here and praise the Lord today? Yeah, this is an awesome day. And if you're online, we're glad you're joining us online as well. And uh, man, what a day it is. And, and I, I, I don't know about you, but you know, I do try to follow the news. And if you follow the news at all, You've seen stuff about the the royals, you know, Harry in particular, and and you know, that stuff going on over in England and that kind of things. And uh, but as I thought about that here recently, and I, I thought about it, you know, they don't really have a king yet. They do have a king name, but he hasn't been coronated yet. But so I was thinking more about the queen. If you remember, you know, pictures of the queen in the past, and her, you know, when she would stand up at her palace and and you know, give a speech or whatever, and her crown and how. How just majestic she really was, and you know, it was just kind of, it was kind of cool the way she she was. She was kind of larger than life, wasn't she? And the crazy thing was about that was she really doesn't have any power, does she? <laughs> she 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 has no power to vote or to even veto anything or anything like that. She her position really is a position of courtesy, if you will. I thought about that, and what England does to the queen, do we do that to our king? Hmm. We give him recognition, we give him all this praise, we, we encase him in beautiful churches, and, and we pay homage to him, but when it comes down to decision-making in our life, does he have a veto <laughs> or a vote even? We acknowledge his position without giving him authority at times, don't we? The sermon series today is not entitled Call to Authority. The sermon is called, or the sermon is titled Authority to Call, because authority actually does matter. Every single society or an organization has authority or a a, a structure of authority. Every great empire has had authority that, uh, that comes down from the top, even to the smallest stranded kids on an island. You remember that story there with the uh, Lord of the Flies? Yeah, some of you are going, yeah, I remember reading that. There was authority there, but it's interesting. The idea of authority in today's society has lost its authority, hasn't it? Authority well, it can't go unchecked, it can't be absolute, or it will get corrupt for sure. There are governmental authorities, and there are personal authorities, aren't there? And what I mean here is, is, is what, do we, what do we really let rule our lives, the decisions and the behaviors? Are you the ultimate authority or something else? It's interesting, I see this in our own community right here in Elkridge, it seems like TikTok has authority over quite a few of our youth that have taken TikTok challenges and have started breaking into cars and kicking down storm doors outside people's houses. This is going on. I understand the authorities did catch a few of them, so good thing. But what authority are you letting dictate your behaviors? That's the point right? What authorities are going to influence and impact you the way you live? In the text today, there I want to share three aspects of Jesus' authority, and I want us to recognize them, and I want to respond to them as well. So if you would, I'm going to ask you to stand and honor and the authority of God's Word today. If you can, please stand with me as I read our text today in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, 
and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their disease. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the authority that it speaks into our life. We pray as we we study this passage today that our heart and our spirit would be in tune with you and let let us respond to what we see and hear today. In Jesus' name, please be seated. We touched on it a little bit last week. In this few chapters we've gone so far in this letter of Luke's, his letter to Theophilus, which we end up getting to see, he's trying to establish Jesus' authority, his power and his position, who he claims to be and who he is clearly demonstrating who he actually is. And he had authority to heal. He had authority to to cast out demons. Interestingly, though, when he went back to his hometown, we remember in Nazareth, well, they didn't want his authority. They wanted to kill him. And so he left, and he goes out and spends his time in the area of Capernaum. And this is what they say there about his authority. Chapter 4, verse 32, And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Just the way Jesus spoke, they understood there was authority behind his words. It says in chapter 4, verse 36, he says, and they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word for what authority and power uh, he commands unclean spirits to come out? And so they're seeing the, the authority of Christ and the power of Christ in the acts that he is doing. And so what I want to do today is, again, look at three aspects of of Jesus' authority and how we might recognize and respond to them appropriately today. The first aspect of Jesus' authority I want us to look at is the source of his authority, and that is the Father. The source of his authority is the Father. It says in verse 12, In those days he went out to the mountain to pray all night, and he he continued in prayer to God. There was a big decision looming in Jesus' life at this time. It was coming up. And we know Jesus to be uh, omniscient at times. He knew what people were thinking. We saw that already in the text in the, pa- in the past. But he's also human and, and, and rightfully in need of going to his Father in heaven as an authority. And so he does. Jesus does this actually quite regularly. And, and even in these first few chapters, Luke has made that quite apparent. If you remember, he went out and prayed all night when he was, or for 40 days when he went into the desert, right? And then in verse 30, 42 of chapter 4, he says, and, and when it came, uh, when it was that day, he departed and went into a desolate place. Now, it doesn't say he prayed, but I, you can assume ba- based on the circumstances, if you remember that text, that he, that's what he was doing. Okay, and then in, if you go into chapter 5, he would withdraw to a desolate place and pray. He had a big deal decision to make in front of him. And, 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 and isn't that what we do? <laughs> it, when, when something big comes up in our life, we're, that's when we're ready to go to the Father and try to, all right, God, help me figure this out. Give me an answer to this. And to be quite honest with you, He wants us to do that, especially when there are big decisions. It's not a bad thing that we do that. He wants us to spend specific time when there are specific things that we must pray about. And we know the Father answered his prayer because we're going to read the list of the names that he chose, or we already have, actually. But I also want you to see how he answered the prayer 
as John talks about it in his gospel, as Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross and he's praying specifically for his disciples, listen to the way he talks about how this prayer that we just read about, he prayed, God answered. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me. That's the 12, folks, out of this world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. The Father, he's literally talking about the answer to the prayer that he was praying. We just read about the 12. God answers prayer. The Father answers the prayer. And the authority of Jesus is seeking clearly. He's seeking it from the Father. He draws on this authority from the Father. How? By prayer. He goes to the Father in prayer. Now, many of you were here for the, the prayer seminar that we did a couple weeks ago, and man, what a blessing that was. And, and one of the, the, the things I got out of that, I knew it, but I was, I was keenly reminded of it, and, and, and some of you have even said the same thing to me about when we pray, it pleases God. He loves it when we go to Him. He loves it when we kneel to Him, when we bow to Him, when we talk to Him. He loves it. It pleases him. And if we connect with God as our Father and our authority in prayer, well, it is a powerful thing. And, and we do this as a church, right? We do this as a church family. There are specific times through the year that we gather for prayer and even fasting that it calls for us to do. And, and I love that Jesus' disciples, and, and we'll read this in chapter 6, um, I believe a little bit later, that they, he asked Jesus, or they asked Jesus, well, how do we pray? And Jesus had an answer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? He teaches them how to pray. Our response to Jesus going to the Father as, as his authority, okay, him doing that, we should do the same, right? Our response, here it is, is continually develop a passionate and persistent and patient prayer life. We, we must consistently develop this. The other thing I learned in the prayer seminar, and this was kind of a hard lesson. I, I didn't learn it. I knew it again, but again, reminded of it. And, and he hit home on this pretty hard, and, and I, I, I was thinking, man, this might be bothering some people. He talked about our prayerlessness in our, in our walk. Prayerlessness is... He called it sin. Our prayerlessness, our lack of praying and going to the Father is sin. I thought, wow. And then I thought, wow, this is a good thing. Because if it's sin, you know what we can do with it? We can confess it. We can repent of it. We can be forgiven of it. And then we can get right back up on our prayer horse and start praying, right? Yeah. Yeah. We can do that, and he wants us to do that. He wants us to develop this prayer life, and I, and I truly believe this is an ongoing thing. I can, I've been praying a lot for the past 30 years in my walk with Christ, and I still feel like I want to do it better. And you know what? That's a, I think that's a good thing. And you probably, and I hopefully will be in, are in the same boat. We, we're not ever going to get quite there. There's going to be times where we, we hear from God and we know we have heard from God. And there's other times where it seems like it's silent. But he wants us to develop this ongoing prayer life and this, this prayer assignment to, to be able to pray without ceasing. It's not that we're on our knees and bow down in every moment, but that prayer, that this we're driving down the road, and we can say, Lord, help me in this meeting I'm going into. And we, we know to go to the Father that way. The question I often hear is, is well, how do you develop this, this great prayer life? Let me tell you the secret. I'm going to tell you the secret. Listen up. Pray more. Yep, that's what you do. You pray more. Now, I'm being a little facetious there, but that is true, and I'll tell you that in just a minute. But there's also ways to, to help you in your prayer life, and, and I think uh, Mark's 
book or, or group on, on Connect Group on Wednesdays. Aren't you guys doing a prayer book or learn to pray? Reading about praying is actually a good thing to do. I've done, I've read multiple books on prayers and, and how to pray and doing those things. But what I t- will tell you is this, is so, some of you know that I'm a swimmer. And, when, and I started swimming about 10 years ago. And when I first started swimming, um, I, I, I swam so poorly that this stranger came up to me and said, uh, dude, you look like a broken fishing lure getting pulled through the water. <laughs> Literally, that's what he said to me. And he gave me a few hints to how to swim better. Uh, but to be honest with you, I taught myself to swim better by going on YouTube and watching multiple videos on YouTube. But if I never got back in the water and started practicing what I was learning, I would have never got any better. And now I'm an adequate swimmer <laughs> after 10 years. <laughs> kind of like our prayer life. It takes a while. It takes a while. I, I am strongly thinking back uh, to bring Adam Nathanson back. And, and we did a two hour deal. It's actually a six-hour deal. We got the uh, Reader's Digest version of that prayer seminar, to be honest with you. If you want him to come back, just keep bugging me, and I will, I will do that. Okay. All right. You want the full deal. We'll do that. We will do that. We'll get it on the schedule. So, again, we were talking about aspects of Jesus' authority. We learned about the source. This source is the Father. We get to the Father through prayer. And if Jesus is the Son of God and He's doing this, how much more do we need to do that, right? So the source of a th- Jesus' authority, well, we, we learned about the source. I want us to learn about the object of His authority, the authority to call people, us. He has the authority to call people, us. He says in verse 13, And when that day came, he called disciples and chose from them twelve who he named apostles. Underline that word, apostles. So we need to realize that there were a bunch of people following Jesus. Okay, There was probably hundreds of people. They were, they were called disciples. They were, they were learners. It, I, I follow a, a podcast called uh, Truth Unites, and uh, this guy Gavin's really amazing. He does a lot of church history stuff, and, and so I'm a disciple of his in a way because some of the things I learn I actually pass on to you at times. But So I'm a disciple. I'm a learner. That's literally what that word means. And it, but in the Jewish culture, it, it may mean a little bit even more. So if you were a disciple of a Pharisee, okay, you wanted to learn how to be a Pharisee, as a young man, you could say, I want to follow this man. I like the way he teaches, and so I will become a disciple to him. So he would, they would follow him, they would learn under him, they would do the things that that person did. Uh, we, we know in, the, in Scripture that, that the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He learned, of a, learned under a very famous um, Pharisee named Gamal. And so that, that, that's this idea of being just a disciple, a follower, and a learner. But the designation here that Jesus uses is apostle. It, it's not a synonym at all, really. It, it means a representative, one set out for a task or a mission. And in the classic Greek, okay, we, the Bible is written in what's called Koine or Common Greek, but in classical Greek, that word would be used to talk about an expedition of of ships going on a mission, okay? That's where that, that, so we get the idea as an apostle, essentially as an individual who is part of a group that is commissioned for a mission to go out. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus gives this mission to his disciples this way. He said, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, okay? Jesus then breathes on the Holy Spirit, and he begins to equip these guys for the mission that they have been given. This verse and four other verses, there's a total of five of them in the Scriptures from each gospel and the book of Acts, 
that tells us these great, this great commission. It's all written a little bit differently, but all says the same thing. We are called to a mission as followers of Jesus. Earlier in this gospel, we read a little bit of what Jesus called this mission. If you remember what he told Peter, he says, you're not going to be fishing for fish anymore. You're going to be fishing for men. Yeah. It was, a, I don't know who the missionary was, but they said it this way. Churches that don't evangelize will fossilize. Hmm. The church is literally, the ecclesia is the Greek word, it means called out ones. We all, as part of the church, are called out for the mission. This is why we do the mission candle. This is why I remind us of this challenge every single week. I need it as much as you do, I'll be be honest with you. This is why we do our our invite, share, lead training to help equip you to to feel more comfortable to to talk about your faith. And we're going to kind of step that up this year and get a kind of part two to that and help you with that as well. But many of us think, I think, wrongly about this idea of sharing our faith or even being a disciple or an apostle, if you will. We think, oh, I'm just a, uh, I'm a regular Joe. There's nothing special about me. Or you might say, I'm not a gifted evangelist. And you might, evangelism is a specific spiritual gift the Bible talks about. And some people are just better at it than others. But it doesn't mean you can't do it. Okay? Sometimes we think that we are completely disqualified because of our past. How could I ever be a representative of God because of what I did? in my past. I think that's exactly why Jesus chose these fellows, (laughs) was for that problem we sometimes think we have. Let me just read the names again. Simon, who was named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. I want to go through that list. I'm going to go through it rather quickly, but I think you need to realize that this group of people that we're going to talk about literally changed the world and filled the halls of heaven. That's what these guys did. Who were these guys? Well, Peter. A lot of us know what Peter's deal was and his story and all his shortcomings, but I think the one that sticks out to me is the time when Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. He told him, he called him Satan. Like I said, we all know about the other ones, but we'll let that one just stand on its own merits there. Andrew, while feeding the 5,000, he was the pessimist. He's like, we can't feed all these people. We only have a few loaves and a few fish, right? (laughs) James and John, they were brothers. They were called the the sons of thunder. Jesus is a cool guy because he gave people nicknames. And I don't know exactly why they got this nickname, but you might think about this incident. If you remember, uh, they were going through Samaria, and, and they said, hey, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and nuke these guys, the Samaritans? A couple racists is what they were. Seriously. How about Philip? Philip was also around at the feeding of the 5,000. He was the CPA. He was the one that said, okay, look, we got of all these people here, that bread costs this much, fish costs this much. We're going to need at least 200 denarii to feed this crowd. Yeah, he was slow to comprehend spiritual things. How about Bartholomew? I look at St. Bartholomew. Isn't that the way he should say his name, right? His name was also Nathaniel, and if you remember when his name was referred to as Nathaniel, he was the guy that first dissed Jesus. He's the one that said, hey, is there anything that could good come out of Nazareth? I don't think so. He doesn't even know Jesus, and he's judging him. That's who he was. And then there's, you know, Matthew, of course, and we all know about him, the tax collector, and he got, you know, if you're a tax collector, you're, you're grouped with rapists and murderers. That's kind of who you are. 
part of his crowd also was James, the son of Alphaeus. We don't really know a lot about him. I guess he was one of those silent guys behind the scenes. And then Simon the Zealot. A zealot was literally somebody that was planning and would do covert operations to destroy the Roman government. They would do assassinating, you, know, you name it. They would do it. That's, that's who these people were, okay? That's who this guy was joining the team here. And then Simon, uh, yeah, Simon the Zealot, and then Judas, the son of James. Uh, he's interesting. He's also known as Thaddeus. He's also known as Libius, I think is how you say that. Um, he, he stood out so much that they couldn't figure out what to call him. Uh, again, kind of one of those behind-the-scenes guys, I guess. And then Judas Iscariot, uh, we all know his deal. He was a traitor. But what's interesting about Judas, the name, it, it actually means praise. Now, wouldn't it be a good idea to name your kid Praise? But do you know a single person named Judas? No, do you? I wouldn't name my dog Judas because of what this guy did. That's his team. <laughs> it really, truly is amazing. But historical documents, church fathers will tell you that each one of these guys went out and spread the gospel and were martyred. For Christ. So think about it. Does it really matter if you think you're qualified to be Jesus' representative, to be called? If you are saved by faith through the grace of God, you are called. You are on a mission. Think about it this way, if you will. If Jesus has the authority to call these 12 apostles would it not reason that he would have the ability to call you and I as well? When I think about the calling, I want us to view calling in view of two ways. Certainly the call to salvation, call to this relationship with Christ. But there is, I believe, another part of the calling. There's salvation, yes, but there is this calling to serve as well. When Jesus called Peter and James and John in chapter 5, again, he, he literally, if you remember that story, he literally helped them co catch a boatload of fish. <laughs> really, two boatloads, because John and James had to come out and help Peter because there were so many fish. And then he said, hey, I'm, I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's chapter 5, verse 10. That was the, the beginning of this calling for him. And we see this uh, mission in the text now uh, and today as well with the 12 men. And Jesus calls them to this mission, and he refers to them as apostles, not just disciples. Called to, to serve the mission as apostles. Think about it this way, too, if you will. Can, can you be a Christian and not be part of a church? I suppose that's possible. You're saved by faith through the grace of God if, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're not part of a church and not on mission, it's like being a baseball player without a team. Think about that for a minute. I, I, I used to play baseball as a kid, and if I was by myself, you know what I could do? I could throw the ball up and catch it. Throw up ball and catch it. Then you get bored. If you had a bat, then you could throw up the ball and hit it. Well, if you only had three balls, you only got to have three hits, and then you go go back and get your mother balls and come back and try it again. It, it gets old after about an hour or two. Jesus said that the only institution that he was going to build is the church. If we're going to be on mission, it really has to be connected to, I believe, a church. And I believe we should prioritize this. I think we prioritize it over our social clubs, over our game, online gaming, over our uh, whatever club you might be in. Now, 
understand this as well. I'm saying just prioritize it. I'm, saying you sh- I'm not saying you can't do other clubs. You can't be part of a hunting club or a fishing club or a boating club or a knitting club or whatever club you like to be part of. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I want you to be part of those clubs because in those clubs, I think he wants us to be fishers of men. In fact, we actually designed this church in such a way, it uh, doesn't seem like that now as, as much, but it, 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 that people can and have the time to do that. And so our response to Jesus' authority and the call to salvation to serve, here you go, our response is this, is to follow God where he lead, is leading you to serve. And the, and the thing is, so many of us sitting in this room today and some of you that are maybe hearing or listening online that are part of this church, we have a great number. In fact, we have that number just continues to increase, and thank you for your service that serve in this church body. It is amazing. But I also do want you to know that even, even if you're not serving or God is leading you in a different way to serve, we're open to that. Example number one, that we have this crafters fellowship that's going to come on. Because Vanessa felt a call to God to say, you know what, I want to open, take, take my gifts and talents and start using them maybe to somehow make, <laughs> influence others, and I, I want to be a fisher of men. And so we're going to start that in February. Amen to that. So we have learned about the source of the authority, again, the Father through prayer. We learned about the object so far of the authority, which is us his ability to call us to both salvation and to service. And the third aspect of Jesus' authority I want us to see in the text is this, the validation of his authority, power to heal. The validation of his authority, the power to heal. Verse 17, he says, He came down with them and stood on a level place with the crowd and his disciples and a great multitude from all of Judea and Samaria and the east coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear and to be healed of their disease. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for the power came from him and healed all of them. The first thing I want you to, t- to notice is this is a healing fest going on. This is one crazy healing revival service thing that's going on. And I, there was at least hundreds, if not thousands of people there, all kneel, needing hope and healing. And they wanted to touch him. I, when I thought about that, all I could, all I could picture in my mind was the, like the crowds of people swarming Elvis. And how just, I don't know, if, I've never had that happen to me. I hope I never do. I don't like being in crowds. But I, could you, I mean, that has to be overwhelming, people just kind of coming at you and wanting to touch you, and I, it's just, wow. It's, it's, but that's literally what's happening to Jesus in, this, in these days here. And the crowd saw it and, and said power was literally coming out from him, and he was healing everybody. What we're clear, clearly seeing is a validation of Jesus' total authority over certainly demons and healings. To validate means to, to confidently confirm with no reservations. Anyone who can heal like this has power, right, and authority. In fact, he has all authority in heaven and earth. Isn't that what he said in Matthew's gospel when he gave the Great Commission? In verse 20, uh, 18, out of chapter 28, he said, and Jesus came to them and said, I have all authority under heaven and earth. It's been given to him. So here's the question. Are you, are you willing to let Jesus' authority heal and work in your life? Are you willing to let Jesus' authority heal and work in your life? If so, what would it be like? What is it that you want Him to heal? What is it you want Him to work on in your life? Is it your marriage? Is it a physical issue, a sickness, maybe it's a persistent sin, maybe it's a, 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 an ongoing feeling of sadness or hopelessness in your life, 
a, a lack of confidence in some way, maybe some anxieties because of the, the situations that you're going in your life? Are you willing to let Jesus' authority bring healing to it? Do you believe that God has the power to overcome all these types of weaknesses that we find ourselves in? Do we believe? Now, I am not promising that God will answer every single prayer the way you want it answered, but I am saying He will help you overcome every weakness, whether it's physical or spiritual or emotional. I believe He does that. I believe He promises that. I believe He promises it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Listen to what He says there. But He said to me, Paul speaking about Jesus literally talking to him. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ rests upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with my weaknesses. I'm content with them. Insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He believed this no matter what or the way Jesus answered that prayer. You got somebody putting you down? Are you putting yourself down? Are you in an overwhelming situation? Are you willing to to believe that in your weakness that God can and will and has the authority to heal you? Many of you know Johnny Eric Cantata. She's a spiritual writer, gifted writer. She, if you know her story, became a quadriplegic as a teenager when she was uh, hurt in a swimming accident. And she's gone on now for decades just encouraging people to love God, even though she's a quadriplegic. One of her, I think, most famous quotes, and I I love this quote, she says, He has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. The more intense the pain, the closer his embrace. Mm. So, folks, our response to the validated authority of Jesus, is this, to live as if there is no weakness in me that God can't make perfect. There is no weakness in me that God can't make perfect. He may not fix it the way I want it. (laughs) But you know what? If we trust Him, He makes it perfect. He makes it perfect. One last quote I want to give to you. R. Kent Hughes, he says this, he says, one of the supreme glories of God's call is that our weaknesses is his opportunity for his power. Our ordinariness makes room for his extraordinariness. I didn't know that was a word, but I love it. We got an extraordinary God that can do extraordinary things in our life, right? It is amazing. It is amazing. And we're called to believe on this authority. We're called to believe that He can save us. He can can wash away our sins. He can forgive us. He can restore us. He can make us born again. He makes us new creatures in Christ. And if you've never done that today, you can do that by trusting in His death, in His burial, in His resurrection. And in faith, going to him and saying, I know I'm a sinner, and I, I, don't, I can't do it myself, but I'm going to trust in what you did on the cross, Jesus. And I, I'm going to let you have authority now in my life. If that's your prayer today, if you did that today, whether you're here or online, you are a child of God. If that has transformed in your heart, you now have a relationship with him, and you can grow that relationship. And you can experience all of this power and authority and healing. And he calls us to to serve. 
to pray, to pray to the Father, the one who has all authority. He calls us to, to serve him, to let him lead us and guide us in our paths of righteousness. Let me just pray for a moment and let God's word just speak to you today as you've heard it and you've read it. Let his authority work in your life in this moment. Pray with me, Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for the authoritative word of God, the word we call the Bible, this wonderful, incredible gift that you've given to us that speaks to us life and love and liberty and salvation. Your word does not go back void. It has all power and all authority to take us from the pits of hell to the glories of heaven, to transform us in our weaknesses. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do. We praise you. And I pray that you, we would give we would invite that would we be willing to pass back over to you because we take it back too many times, your authority in our life. Father, let you reign in there. Let you reign in us. And everybody says,